we're uh, we're getting farther into our study of Genesis, and this is a this is kind of a fun fun section to be in this morning. And as I was I was thinking about this section, I couldn't help but think about it. I've named this before, but uh, one of the things that struck me was that there is a, a theme of, of impatience, a, a, thing of, a theme of trying to take things into your own hands. Uh, that seems to be one of the things that we see happening here in this story. And as I thought about that, I thought about for myself in my, own, in my own life. I thought about when I was in my 20s, when I was watching my friends get married and dating and falling in love. And I remember being in my 20s just When's, when's this going to happen for me? When's my turn? And I remember getting impatient about it. I, I remember uh, early on I'm watching my friends and I'm, I'm thinking, well, if they're getting married, how come I'm not getting married? Or uh, I, I did things to try to find uh, find that person. I tried too hard. I tried to make things work that obviously weren't meant to work. Um, and, and I settled for less. And as I, I think about that period of my life, um, and now I'm married, uh, and, and have a great life, and have the person that I was... Uh, that I was meant to have. Um, I, I look back and I think one of, one of the things that happened in my life was I gave up. I gave up trying to be the one that was looking. I, and it just it happened. Um, and, and when things, when I wasn't looking, that's when things fell into place. And as I think about that, I, I go back to one word that I kept saying over and over again. And the word is I. Everything was about me. I was at the center of the story. I, I was the focus. It was what mattered to me. And you mix that idea, I'm an only child, I don't know if you can relate to that, but I can think like I am the center of the universe. I can, I do that. I, I put my agenda front and center. And as I thought about that, I thought that, that concept, that idea, that ties in with what we're looking at this morning in Genesis. And, and as you think about this for yourself, I, I, this idea of putting ourselves and our agendas and trying to make things work that weren't meant to work, I think we can all quickly admit that we all do that. We all we can all be guilty of making our own interests, our own plans, our own agendas uh, be the front and center of thing, rather than just trusting in the plan uh, that God has for us. This this morning we're in uh, Genesis 21, um, but before we go to Genesis 21, I, I think there's some backstory that we need to get uh, that we need to to see to help us to understand a little bit more about the story of Abraham. And last week, Pastor Ed shared about Abraham. And as we looked at the story of Abraham, and as we, as we see all the different other stories that we can look at in the life of Abraham, there is so much that we can look at simply just in the life of just this one man. We could do a sermon series for a couple months on, on who Abraham is, but that's not what we, we're going to do. Uh, this morning we're going to jump back into who he is and a part of the story that God had in his life. And, and one of the things that I, I trust that you know about Abraham is that God... Uh, promised through Abraham and through his family that he would be the father of many nations. This is one of the just key characteristics of what God passed on to Abraham. And, and here's the problem, though. This is the connection uh, that I hope that you uh, will hear about this morning. It's that he and his wife, they get impatient. They don't, they don't want to trust in the plan that God had for them. And they use a servant to bring a child into the world. And that, that child that's brought into the world, uh, his name is Ishmael. Well, I want to I back you up from chapter 21. I want to just get some of the backstory, uh, And I, first, I'll take you to chapter 16. And just quickly, uh, chapter 16, this is what we see. Sarai, who would later become Sarah, uh, she says to her husband, Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And the Bible says that Abraham agreed to this plan. It's a, it's a crazy plan. It's a very self-serving plan. And if you drop down a few more verses to verse 8, same chapter, uh, now you see Hagar. Hagar is this servant. And she's on the run, and she's talking to an angel, and this is their conversation. <laughs> then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants, and they too will be numerous, too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Then I'll just I'll take you one more place in the story. Chapter 17. Uh, this, is, this is where God is, is speaking to Abraham. And he tells him of the son that will come. Subsequently, that son is, is Isaac, who is born. Chapter 17, this is what it reads. It says, uh, God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you will no longer call her Sarai. You will call her Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come to her, come from her. <coughs> Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? 
Will Sarah bear the child at age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will increase his numbers. And he will be the father of twelve rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. So what we learn as you kind of just hear just bits here is that Ishmael was not the son that God intended for Abraham to have, but Isaac is. And as you hear about this, just quickly, this is the starting point that uh, that the Muslim world has had as a debate between them and the Jews and the Christians. This is why they hate uh, the Jews and the Christians today, because they believe that Muhammad comes from the line of Ishmael. Okay, that's the backstory. That sets us up, sets us up to where we are today. That's, that gets us to chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, uh, I'll ask you to turn to chapter 21. And I'm going to break 21 up into three sections. And this is the first section, uh, which takes us to verse 8, 1 to 8. And this is, this is the positive side of the story that we see early on. Here's, here's where the story is at now. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At that very time God had promised him. Abraham gave, him, uh, gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has brought laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, Who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that you would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his age. And the child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac weaned Abraham, he held a great feast. This part of the story, this is, this is a great scene to have been a part of. Great stuff happens here. And, and just quickly... This promise that God had given, this is where this comes to happen, just like God promised. And, and if you ever wanted to kind of just wonder, can God make people laugh? This is a section which shows us of a family that's laughing. Uh, Sarah is so pleasantly surprised, and the scriptures have put this here for us to see this, that she laughs out loud. And, and the other incredible detail that I think that just we should just recognize is that God here, he shows us himself as a God who is constantly defying the odds. Uh, anyone who would say that he would bear a child at such an old age would be considered foolish. But that's what God said. And that's what happens. And God here proves that he defies the odds. I, I love thinking about God that way. But think about Sarah. Think about Abraham. Think about their attitude. They don't take God seriously. Uh, at least early on, they didn't take God seriously. They, they take actions into their own hands. And think about that for ourselves. Uh, do, we, do we take God's word always as serious as God has invited us to take it? As I thought about that, I couldn't help but think about the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah offers the words that God has a plan for us. We love those words. We put them on bumper stickers, on greeting cards, on mugs, on bookmarks. We put them everywhere that God has a plan. But do we take those words, do we take them for what they're worth? I think sometimes we just, we relegate them to, to wishful thinking. Uh, we, we just, we don't, we don't see them as meaningful when things seem uh, hard. The truth of the matter is that God has a plan, and he's unfolding that plan. And that's what I believe that, uh, that Abraham and Sarah needed to hear. They needed to see that. They needed to be a part of that. And I believe that's a part for us as well, that we get to hear about this plan that God has for us and how God wants to work through us through that plan. We'll jump back into the story of Abraham and Sarah. I'll pick up at verse 9. And verse 9, it, it shifts. It's no longer this everything's happy, this everything's good story. This is where the shift happens. Uh, and this is what it reads. It says, But Sarah saw that her son, who Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of your maid servant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Well, one of the things that kind of struck me here was the theme of jealousy. Jealousy and competition, it seems to be this thing that's just snuck into the whole scenario. And, and here it's driving, it's driving Sarah's thoughts, and she now regrets, it seems, uh, this decision that she made early on to have her husband uh, 
uh, be with Hagar, and she's coming to, to be jealous of this situation. And think about that for ourselves. Can't we relate to being jealous? I mean, I, I said before, I was jealous of my friends. I was watching my friends get married. I wanted what they had. I can relate to being, to being jealous. I'm sure you can as well. And when jealousy gets into our hearts, uh, our hearts become compromised. Our hearts become willing to look for shortcuts, willing to take things into our own hands. Well, it's this point in the story where Sarah, uh, she now is, is looking at this plan that she's uh, contrived, and she's comparing that plan to God's plan. And she's seeing, she's seeing the failures in her plan. Sometimes I wonder, if, if we could... If we could have a script of life all written out for us, if we knew how life would end, if we knew how certain events were going to end, um, and, and we thought about the shortcuts that we could take to get to some of the endings that, in the story that we'd like to be a part of, would we take those shortcuts if we knew that those shortcuts would bring about uh, pain and, and bring about just the things that were not good for us? Would, would things be any different? And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? Even if I knew what some of the shortcuts, what, what they were going to do to me, I probably still at least sometimes choose some of those shortcuts. Kind of wishful thinking, hoping that maybe, maybe this script isn't going to happen the way that it says it's going to happen. Well, this section of scripture that we've got in front of us right here, this, this whole chapter, this speaks so loudly about the gospel. There's something else, though, that I think that we need to hear as well. There's a life lesson that can bear much fruit as well. And the life lesson that we get to see from Abraham and Sarah is simple. It's that actions have consequences. Think about Sarah and Abraham. Think about their actions. And think about how they, they take things into their own hands. They, this, this promised child, they're just getting impatient. And they bring this child into the world through their servant instead of through Sarah. And, and there's consequences from that. Uh, this, this adds stress to Abraham and Sarah's uh, marriage. Uh, this, this complicates, to say the very least, the relationship that they have with their servant. This also creates tensions between them and between their sons. I would assume that when they got married, when they were newlyweds, they never said, oh, let's, later on in life, let's make this our plan. Let's have things happen this way. I'm sure that's not what they planned to have happen. But that's what did happen. And because of that, they have to live with these consequences. And, and these consequences, they lead Sarah and Abraham to actually kick Hagar and her son out of their community. And, and while for Sarah, that might have been somewhat of a, a relief. Oh, they're gone. Abraham, this is going to be a painful thing that he has to deal with as well. But as we look at the story, this isn't how the story ends. The, the story doesn't end with them simply having to just live with the consequences from their actions. Even in the midst of this mother, Hagar, and her son getting uh, ousted from their community, God still works with them. God still gives them his grace. God still cares for them. And God lets Abraham know uh, that even then they will be cared for. There, there's two things that kind of clue us into that. And the first is that Isaac, this one that God promised, that Isaac is the one that's going to be used to straighten this all out. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then as well, God promises that Ishmael, Ishmael would become a great nation as well. And those two things, they should blow us away with how graceful and how giving God is. God is promising here that he is going to use this child that he planned for to make things right. And God is promising that Ishmael, Ishmael would as well be the, uh, the leader of a great nation. And that was not the norm in, in this sort of situation. Uh, the, the law back in these days, if, if this was the situation, the law would say that if, if the mother of the servant, if the servant mother was uh, kicked out of her community, that her child no longer was entitled to the inheritance. That's not what God promises here. God promises actually that, uh, that Ishmael will still uh, receive this, this promise. He will still be blessed as well. Well, I'll give you one more glimpse of the story. I'll take you to verses 14 to 21. And this is the last section that we'll look at this morning. And hopefully this kind of just makes the story come full circle. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and set them off from her with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. As she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? 
Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water, and she gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert, and he became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Now, you hear the last section of the story, and you might want to grimace as you hear part of the story. But even here, God shows us how God is working, how God is moving, and how God is graceful. I'll just name a few of the details and just kind of close into that. The, the part of the story that you might want to grimace about is where Sarah is kicked out. And, and it, seems, it seems instantaneous. It seems like, well, Sarah and Abraham, they, they come up with this, the, this plan to kick Hagar out. And I don't think that's the case. The, the scripture kind of gives us a couple clues to let us know that, uh, yes, this is what happened. But it, it might not have happened just instantaneously. The Bible says uh, that, that Ishmael is put under a bush. Okay, first clue. It's not something you would normally do is put a baby under a bush. It kind of clues us in that maybe he's a little bit older. And then the Bible goes on and it says uh, that, that he's a boy. It doesn't refer to him as a baby. It refers to him as a boy. Multiple times it refers to him as a boy. Cluing us in that he's, he's not just a young baby. Uh, he, he's old enough now uh, where he's able to take care of himself a little bit more, to say the very least. And, and what I hope that you're seeing here is that it seems like over the course of just a few sentences, that we're watching the progression of Ishmael, that he's gone from baby to somewhat of a, of a boy. And as you see that, you find out that, yes, Sarah and Abraham, they wanted to kick uh, Hagar and, and Ishmael out right away. And it seemed like at first that, did God go along with that? But what you find out is that God didn't go along with their plan right away. God was like, all right, if they're going to leave, I'm going to provide them. I'm going to take care of them. Um, but it's not going to be, Sarah, the way that you've got a plan. It's going to be the way that I've got a plan. You also see here how God provides with, with water. It's another example of, of how God is providing uh, in the midst of, of this story. Now, even though this was not the plan that God had, uh, God is able to work through this situation. He's able to demonstrate that he is God and that he has a plan and that he loves his children. And the, the glimpse that we get of, of who God is, that God is loving, that God is providing, uh, that helps us see how much uh, more God would ultimately do through Isaac, the one who he promised to come into this world to make things right. And, and that was the plan of God all along, that through Isaac, God would rescue and lead his people. God told Abraham and Sarah that this son, Isaac, uh, that he would be their son, that he would be the king of many people, uh, and that he would be who uh, God established his covenant with. Check out with the... Uh, what Galatians chapter 4 has to say about this. And this is what was read for scripture this morning. But Galatians chapter 4, verse 28. Now you brothers, like Isaac, you are children of the promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the spirit, by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Paul makes it clear who the people are, the characters in this story are. And, and just for Hagar's sake, uh, Hagar's son, he represents those who have come into the world through uh, only a natural birth, not a heavenly birth. While Isaac, Isaac is the miracle child. He is the child that comes into the world not in the ordinary way. Sarah was well beyond uh, years of, of being able to bear a child. No human effort could have produced this child. Well, in light of all that, Abraham and Sarah's, th their plan, it, it showed their distrust of God. It showed how they thought they could bring about what, uh, what they wanted all along. And it shows a downright lack of trust in God. It shows that they trusted more, than, uh, more in themselves than they did in God. And in Abraham's eyes, God was simply just moving too slow. Over and over again, the Bible uh, makes promises to his people, promises to be with them through the hard times, promises to give them what they need, promises of hope, on and on. How often, though, do we look at those promises and, and we just kind of start dreaming up our own ways to get to uh, the result of those promises? And, and what we do, you know what we do? We start taking control of something that we were not meant to take control of. 
Know that in the difficult times to trust God, that, that God is not moving too slowly. Actually, he's moving at the pace that he planned to move. And God's plan all along for Isaac was that Isaac would enter the world and that Isaac would make an impact on this world for God's purposes. And it's through Isaac's genealogy that we get to Jesus. And in chapter 22, Isaac, he's, he's sacrificed, or he's, he's brought to the altar uh, to be sacrificed. This gives us a glimpse of what God would do in Christ for each of us. He would send his son into the world, uh, his son to make right what Adam made wrong. God's word this morning, and I believe it's inviting each of us to trust in the plan that God has for us. And God's plan is good, and God's plan is great, and, and God's plan happens in God's timing. And, and when we plan and we scheme in our own strength and our own plans, it always complicates life. That's what this section of scripture teaches us. We see who Ishmael is. We see that Ishmael is born, and he becomes the lineage that Muslims will look to. And while God's plan wasn't for uh, Islam uh, to be, or for people to look to Islam for answers, God's plan was that through the line of Isaac that people would find their answers. That people that were looking uh, to the line of Ishmael, that they would actually look to the line of Isaac, that they would see Christ. We live in a world uh, that, that's fearful, that's put off by uh, the Muslim community. But God is inviting us to share with them the work of Christ on their behalf. How, how different the work of Christ is, that, that Christ's message is that we don't have to do this. We don't have to take things in our own hands. That God has already done that for us. And that's not just a message for the Muslim. That is a message for all of us. That, that God is inviting us to not have to deal with this stuff. That God is simply saying, I have dealt with this already for you. 